Have you ever had high expectations going to a place? Um, things that you wanted to do there or things that you expected will happen once you get there. I was a little bit excited to the fact that we were going to Mindoro. It's an island um, in the Philippines. And they told us we were going to stay in a resort. And so I was so excited. We're going to be in a resort beach doing evangelism. At first, I thought we would live with uh, the members. But the idea of being in a resort came, really sank in. And I was already imagining having access to Wi-Fi, you know, talking to my wife every single night and um, getting in touch with the world that I left behind. But as you know... It didn't happen the way I expected it would. Simply because probably, you know, where we stayed was a little remote place. And so I did not get that Wi-Fi, that free Wi-Fi in the resort. Even the signal was so weak that even in my room, I could not even get in touch with anyone. But thank God I was able to find a spot just close by to the, to the seashore. That's where I will go and stay at that spot and be able to talk to my wife very late at night. High expectation, but disappointed with what was offered. But you see, I managed somehow to be able to, to enjoy the other good side of that place. Mangoes were so delicious. Things that I see in the markets here and I'm like, nope, I ain't buying this because it's just too expensive. And I, we ate mangoes so much that some people actually got sick because they ate too much mangoes. Um, also, the people were so, so nice. They were poor, but they were very, very very happy with having us with them. We went as a group of um, Japanese pastors and laymen to Mindora. About 52 of us went there to share the good news with the people of Mindora. And um, we have a lot of um, people from Tokyo International Church, laymen, just members like you, and um, they went, they left their work, they went for two and a half weeks to preach the gospel. Some of them, it was the first time preaching an evangelistic series. And they did so, and they were blessed. Delgin was with us, and she did great. I will share with you how many people were baptized at her place. But the Philippines was nice. As you can see on the right, I'm on top of something. Who can guess what that is? Yes, I'm on top of a jeepney, something I've never done before, but it happened in the Philippines. So that's uh, the group of people from my church where I, I spoke, and they took me and they told me, hey, come up. I was like, that, is that okay? They say, yeah, it's fun. So I went up there, we went through the city, and I had, I had a good time. Went around visiting people, praying for them, inviting them to come to the meetings in the evening, and I took some pictures with uh, the kids there. I hope we could, um, one of these days, you know, collect some clothes and some goods and send to these people up in the mountains in Mindoro. That's the jeepney and the fun we had. I also got to spend time with some farmers from the church. They invited me to their farm. Um, and they asked me to pray over the farm and pray for them. And that was something I've never done before, but I really enjoyed doing it. 
and the people were so happy. We visited homes. You can see this is a home that we visited and we prayed for the people. God has been so good. When I was leaving, I thought I was going to be in a church where I will, I will speak every night. A church probably beautiful like um, the one we have here. But this is where God sent me, to a basketball court, an open but covered court where I spoke every night. And people will come every night and listen to the Word of God. It was a wonderful experience. It was my first time preaching 17 sermons back to back, nonstop. And um, I was personally, you know, um, revived and blessed by the messages as I preached and shared it with our people there. And so many times you may have expectations that do not happen the way you plan or even dreamed of. And in the Bible, we've had many people who had expected something and they received something different. How do you cope with that situation? Japanese pastors leaving their comfort zones and going to a place that is very much tough to live in. Electricity was just going off and on. And um, people were used to being in the AC and they couldn't get that 24-7. It was difficult for some, but it was fun to know that God can still work even when the conditions are not the way we are used to. And so I thank God for Okinawa. I thank God for the life we live here. I think I even forgot how life used to be back then, back home or some places that are not fortunate like we are here. And so Ephesians 3, 20 to 21 tells us, as um, Sister has read it, Sachiko, it says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we may ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, you've led a group of people from Japan to go and share the good news with them. Last time a group of Japanese went there, it was to colonize or to, to make war with the Filipinos. But this time they brought good news, good tidings to that island. And it was a blessing. The result is all to your glory. And today as we listen to more about what happened in Mindoro, about how you can work in our own lives, in our own church here, I pray, dear Father, that your Spirit speak to us today that you may use me, and that I may decline and decrease, and that you may increase, and that your people may see you at the end of this message. I ask you all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mindoro for Christ. It's when after we finish the, um, the, the meetings on Saturday on the 24th, we had so many people gathered at that beach to, for the baptism. I will tell you the number later on. But Del Jean was able to um, speak and also have about 25 people give their life to Jesus from her site. So each one had one site. And um, from my site, about 18 people um, gave their lives over to Jesus. And every single person had a different experience. By the end, we all acknowledge that it was not by our own might, our own knowledge, or even preaching skills. It was the Holy Spirit working upon the hearts of people and making um, the changes in their lives. And so what I thought about this, this group of Japanese people leaving Japan, going to the Philippines to do evangelism, and also share 
in that gospel commission that we receive. Go ye therefore into all the world, teaching, preaching, and baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This commission we took at heart, and we did so in the Philippines. You can just imagine Japanese people struggling with English and preaching those sermons every night in English. We wake up in the morning, have breakfast. Food was great, by the way. They, they fed us so much that I, I even told um, my church that I don't want to eat at night anymore. It's just too much. I, I fear that when I get back, my wife will not recognize me and I might just stay somewhere else. So I told them, please just give me fruit in the evening. That will be enough. They were so nice. And the, what I, I, so we wake up in the morning, we have breakfast, and then we'll practice the, the, the sermon. So I was paired up with the Japanese, and I was, I would preach, and they would repeat, I will preach until the end. And we'll do that every single day so that it will be a little bit easier for them. And they did so. I was impressed, but they did so because God was with them. One church in the Bible caught my attention as I thought of what we did in Mindoro. And that church is a church revealed in the book of Revelation. Let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. I'll read from verse number 1. Revelation 2. Verses 1 through 5. Are you there? Say amen when you get it. The Bible says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says, He who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, and you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, Repent and do the first works, or else I will come quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you do what? You repent. God was talking to the church of Ephesus. And he told, he acknowledged that this church had a first experience that was marked with childlike simplicity and fervor. Uh, it, they, this church was lively engaged in evangelism. And um, their, their love for souls was so great that they converted people. People were joining the church at that time. And the believers rejoiced in the love of God because Christ was in their hearts and he was an abiding presence. And so they continued praising God on their lips. They could not just keep quiet of what God has done for them, what Christ has done for them. And so they were sharing that gospel everywhere they went. They were not ashamed of the gospel. But you see, that was their first experience. That's how it all began. They were on fire for Jesus, and they preached the gospel, and people were converted, and people joined the church. Um, in Testimony, Volume 6, page 421, it says, The praise of God was on their lips, and their attitude of thanksgiving was in accord with the thanksgiving of the heavenly family. You see, the church of Ephesus was even commanded by Paul in the book of um, Ephesians 1, verse 11. Ephesians 1, 11 says this. Paul is talking to the church of Ephesus. Ephesians 1, 15 says, It says, Therefore, I also, after I heard 
of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Paul was saying that, yes, I've heard of how you're faithful to God, but also how you love every single person that comes into your midst. And he did not stop there. He continued to praise their love for people, their genuine love for the soul, and how this church worked together in unity in doing what? To save the lost. They did that. But Paul told them not to stop there. You've got to continue. You've got to keep going and show this. In verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 2, Paul says, Beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. And verse 15 of the same chapter, Paul continues and tells, he, he tells them this. Verse 15 says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Paul wanted them to continue to grow in this love. Not just preaching love, but also acting love. The way they tell the truth should be in love. The way they, 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 they are patient with one another should also reflect love toward others. That's how God's church was supposed to reflect a place where love is not just preached, but also lived. But something happened. This church has changed its behavior its attitude, its ways. They didn't love as they should. And what happened? They were not the worst Christians, but something was not right. They were not the best Christians afterward, but they were not the worst either. They had the truth, but love was no longer found in the things they were doing. And so God says, Revelation chapter 2, says, I have this against you. Revelation 2, we read it a while ago. He says, unless you repent, I'm going to come quick. Unless you repent. What do we need to repent from? God is telling the church of Ephesus, unless you change your mindset, I'm going to come and judge you. Unless you, you, you change the way you think, your priorities, I'm coming quickly. Unless you change your ambitions, your lifestyle, I'm coming quickly. God is telling this church, although they've loved, although they've preached the gospel, although they've brought so many people in the church, and then stop caring the way they should, Loving the way they should, changing their ways, their mindset is no longer toward reaching the lost. It was more on their own selfish ambitions, pride, and priorities. And God says, unless you repent, judgment is upon you. Could it be that God is telling us today, unless, messen, you change your priorities, I'm coming quickly. Unless all I see repents from what we're not doing. We know the truth. We claim to have it, but do we live it? Are we living according to the light we received? Revelation 14, verse 7. We've been preaching about Revelation the whole time in, the, in Mindoro. Verse 7 says, Revelation 14, 7, it says, Sing with a loud voice. This is the first angel. Sing with a loud voice. Fear God and give glory to Him for what? The hour of His judgment has come. Brothers and sisters, God is speaking to us today. God is judging His church as I speak. We're going to be the first one. 
will be judged. If your name were to come up, what will be the result? Would it be, well done? Or will it be not enough? Testimonies to the church, volume 6. Sister Ellen White says, Brethren and sisters who have long claimed to believe the truth, I ask you individually, have your practices been in harmony with the light, the privileges, and the opportunities granted to you of heaven? If I may ask you that question today, have your practices, beloved, been in harmony with the light we received from God? What would be the, the answer to that? It's a personal question. You may answer it individually. If not, if my practices haven't actually been in harmony with the light I received, the light I preach, the light I claim to have, is there any hope for me? Is there any hope for us? That's the question. Yes, we know it, but for some reasons, we are not living the truth. What's next, Pastor? Second Peter. What do I do? Second Peter verse 1. Second Peter verse 1 says, Second Peter 1, verses 2 to 4. Are you there? Second Peter 1. Two to four. The Bible, my Bible says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We have everything. You may ask, yes, I'm not living it, but what can I do? We've got everything we need through the power that works in us. Through the Holy Spirit, through the Bible, we've got everything we need for godliness and righteousness. So we cannot say we don't have it. We don't know what to do. We do know because God has given us everything we need. And so the question is, if we have everything, why are we not using what God has given us? Why are we not cooperating with the Holy Spirit in order to be the people he has called us to be. You see, while I went out every single day before the messages, visiting people, I went to my location and it was supposed to be already a, a, a site that was already worked, meaning there was someone visiting the people, invitation were, you know, were done, and they invited the people, but it was not the case. And so I went out and I said, so where are the people? Can you take me to some of the people you invited? I would like to visit them. And um, we went around, and they did not invite the people. And so it was the first time people were actually listening to what was going to happen. There was the poster, but they did not do door to door. They did not invite the people. But as I went to each and every house, God put upon my heart to ask, do you have any need? I would like to pray for you. 
Could you believe that in each and every house there was a need? That when I offered prayer, they did not reject it? People asked for pray, prayer for health. People asked prayer for their families. People asked prayer for their jobs. People asked prayer for their future. Do you think your neighbors don't have needs? Tell me. Do you think your family members don't have needs? Are you asking them to know what their needs are? Are you praying, offering prayer for them? Sometimes, yes, we live in a society where people are private people. They don't want to share what they're going through. But if you never ask, they will never tell you. Yesterday, oh, I think it was on Thursday, I visited my wife at work. And we've been praying for this woman and her husband. Her husband is losing his, um, his muscles. And um, as I stood in her work, and I was talking to this woman for the first time, I would say, we talked about many things, but it got to the point that she was sharing with me now what she was going through and how difficult the situation has been for her and her children. And she told me something. She said, well, we know that there's nothing else we can do. Meaning she's already giving up because the doctors have told her it's nothing, he's going to lose his muscles. So it's, it's going to be like that. And I told her, yes, you might not have anything else to do. I might not have anything you know, else to give you, but I know there's someone who can do the impossible. And that is God. That even if we cannot do anything, He can do something. He healed the lame. He resurrected the dead, I was telling her. And a little bit, I saw that you know, her eyes kind of brighten up. And before I left, I was not supposed to. I hope I won't put you in trouble. I asked her, would you mind for me to offer a prayer for you? Guess what? She didn't say, no, you can't do that here. She said, yes, please. And I prayed for the, that woman. And we left. You will never know what people are going through unless you care. So my question for us today is, do you care? Do you care enough to listen to people hurting in the church? People hurting in your workplace? People hurting in your neighborhood? But you never care to ask because you don't want to be rejected. I experienced that too. Not in every house. People ask me. I went to one house. The man was from Iglesia Ni Cristo. You know, I don't know if you know that. It's Iglesia Ni Cristo is a Christian church, I believe. But the owner of that church, the founder, used to be an Adventist. And so when I went there and invited him, he just told me, I am from the Iglesia Ni Cristo. I didn't get it, what he meant by that. So meaning, you cannot talk to me. You cannot even pray for me. And later on, I was told that they believe they are the chosen. And so, like, somebody else could not help them. They are the ones to help others, right? And so, I was rejected, but I took it. I walk away, and that's fine. But what if? What if I didn't offer? I wouldn't have known. You never know if somebody will accept to receive a prayer or even help. We reject the light we receive because it goes against the lust. It goes against self-gratification. It goes against flesh. In every single heart, every single sinner, we Reject the light we receive because we do not like the light because it goes against something we like. We don't want to follow what God says because if I follow, I'll have to give up something. And so we act as if we didn't know. We act as if it doesn't matter. And so we tell ourselves, 
we don't need this. Or we postpone to next time. This year, I'm not ready for this. Maybe next year, I'll be ready. How do you know you're going to make it till next year? Every house we went to, it was so difficult because some people, I felt so close to these people, they understood the truth. They, they, they knew what it was. And the Bible was just explaining itself. But it was so difficult for them to make that step forward and fully commit to the truth. And that I see also among us. Not only non-believers, but even believers today. Because every one of us, there is a light in your life you are not fully embracing. Why? Because it touches something you like. It touches something you don't want to give up. My question for you this morning is, is that thing worth dying for? Whatever it may be, is it worth dying for? You tell me now. Jesus died for you and me because he thought and he knows that you and I are worth dying for. But the question is, whatever it is, when you think about it, is it worth for you dying for? Jesus didn't die for you to enjoy sinful living. No. He didn't die for you to continue breaking the Sabbath, as you know. He died that you and I may have everlasting life. So we can give up those things and follow him. But we say, no, I'm still in this world. I got to enjoy it fully. Because tomorrow or in heaven, I might not have this. This is the only time I will get to enjoy this. And so we, we give up what is more important. One lady that I met there, her name is, Yoke, um, her name is um, Armanda. Armanda was invited to the meetings, but she didn't come for two, two nights. And so we went to visit her. And I asked her, why didn't you come? She said, oh, I had a pain in my calf, and I couldn't really walk. And so I asked her, do you believe God can heal you? She said, yes, I do. I said, okay, I'm going to pray for you, and I know I'm going to see you tonight. And so I prayed for her. Guess what? When I started the meeting, I saw her come. And at the end of the meeting, I asked her, so how is your cough? She said, oh, the pain is gone. I said, praise God, you made it. And throughout the whole series, she came every single night, but she did not give her life over to Jesus. And I asked why? Because she was in charge of the Catholic Church in her, in her you know, barangay. And so it was difficult for her to to go forward and leave all that behind because people were looking up to, you know, to her. But I'm praying. When I preached about the Sabbath, this lady believed it, and she worshiped with us the first Sabbath. And then the next Sabbath, she witnessed the baptism on the last Sabbath. And I believe that she will get baptized in the near future. But it was not easy for her to make up her mind for Jesus. Every, every Thursday at 3 p.m. I'm telling you all these stories because I want you to get something. Many times we think people don't need Jesus. Many times we think people are not interested in religious stuff. But the truth is, there are people interested. You just don't know who they are because you never care to ask. Every Thursday we have a Bible study here. It is an English class for Japanese people. And among the group, there is one, if I'm not mistaken, that is not a believer. All the others are from other churches, and they come, Sachiko's friend. And um, she came, and she's been singing our songs, 
reading the Bible and just learning English. She already knows how to speak, but just to practice. And yesterday, as we ended the class on Thursday, sorry, I asked, who would like to pray? And none of you know, the other members wanted to volunteer because you have to do it in English. So that's probably the reason why they were not into volunteering. And this lady, who is not a believer, said, okay, I'm going to pray. How do you start the prayer again? And I said, okay, oh, you can go with um, our Heavenly Father. And she said, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the class. We thank you for this and that and that. And then at the end, we helped her and said, in Jesus' name, amen. This is a Japanese not a Christian, who is willing to pray. How will we know that she was even interested to pray if we did not invite her to be in that environment? How many more Japanese out there would like to know more about the Bible? And she's coming because she also wants to know more about the Bible. But we never care to even give an opportunity to help those people. Many people are dying for truth, but we are failing because we are scared to be rejected. We are ashamed to be rejected. But God is working, and he's going to use people to do his work. Matthew 5, 13 to 16 says this. Matthew chapter 5. Christ is talking to you and to me. He's saying, you are the salt of the earth. Matthew 5, 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled on the foot by man. Verse 14 says, you are the light of the world. A seed that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. 15, nor do the light uh, a lamp and put it under a basket but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Brothers and sisters, the flavor comes from God. Your connection with God. Jesus is that flavor in your life. If you do not have Jesus in your life, if your life is not centered around Jesus, your words are not centered around Jesus, you will lose that flavor. And there's nothing we can do. We have a lot of Christians today, a lot of Adventists, but they've lost that flavor because they do not live for Christ anymore. They live for themselves. There's nothing we can do unless we are connected with Christ. Unless we are connected with Christ, we are useless. And if you want to stand alone, you will continue to be useless to the world, to the society. Hebrews 3.15 says, Hebrews 3 15. Are you there? Hebrews 3.15. The Bible says, While it is said, Today if you hear, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. God is talking to you and to me today. And he's saying, if you hear his voice today, do not continue to be in rebellion. What is rebellion? It's simply disobeying God. All of us are in rebellion, one way or another. If you do not listen to God's word, in Matthew 24, 37 to 44, it says, Christ is coming. And his coming is going to be a surprise to many. He's going to come like a thief, but not for the faithful one. Christ's coming for the faithful is not going to be like a thief. 
But for those who do not expect it, he's going to come like a thief. And so I ask, if I die today, the next time I'm brought up to life is either seeing Jesus in the clouds or seeing Jesus with the saints in the holy city. I have to make a choice today. The first one is the first resurrection. And that's for the saints. The second one is the resurrection for damnation. Whatever choice you make today will seal your destiny. If I were to die today, what will be my destiny? Do you desire to see Jesus? Do you long to be with Jesus? If so, why aren't we fully committing our lives to him? He says, and this gospel shall be preached into the whole, whole world, and the end will come. If you and I really want to see Jesus, what are we going to be doing? Preaching, sharing the good news. Because only until then, he will come. But by not preaching it, we're saying, don't come yet. Stay where you are. I like life right here. And we continue to do so while many are perishing. I have a sad story to share. When I began my series, there was a lady I visited and I invited for the series. She came for about three nights. The fourth night, I was told that she was rushed to the hospital. Something appeared that she was bitten by a dog. And um, when she got to the hospital, they gave her an injection against the rabies, they call it. And um, she, it did not, something happened. It was the wrong prescription. The diagnosis was not right, and half of her body was paralyzed. She was in a coma afterward. And about a week after that, she passed away. I was so, so sad. We went to visit her husband. He wasn't coming, so only the wife came. And he was telling us a story. And I just realized just how fragile life is. That she came every single night. And thank God, every single night I made an appeal for anyone to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And as I was preaching, I was saying this, yes. But even within me, I was not thinking that the following day, I might not even be alive. I was preaching and I was saying, what if tomorrow I'm not here? What if this is your last message? Would you like to give your life to Jesus? Made appeals. People stood up. And I believe she did stand up. When I called for baptism, She didn't come forward. I don't know what is in the heart of the people, but I said, God knows your heart. And if you have made up that decision for him, he will seal that decision for you. The woman passed away. And I have this hope that she got to listen to three sermons. And she got to make a decision for Jesus Christ every single night. And I hope she has surrendered her life before she died. But you see, all those people who came every night never thought tomorrow they won't be alive. No one thought just by taking her to the hospital. And later on, it was not even because of the bites of the dog. It was something else related to nerve because she had a tooth problem and I think it was connected to the nerve. 
And later on, when she died, they found out that it was a wrong diagnosis. Could you even believe that you could go to the hospital just for a headache and you just never going to come out? It's possible. But we never think of those things. And every single time I preach, I told myself, every single sermon will become as if it's my last. Every single appeal will be as if it's my last. Because life is fragile. You may have plans. You may think 20 years from now, you're going to be here. And you still have the opportunity to make a decision for Christ. But the truth is, you have no idea what's coming up the next five minutes, the next 10 minutes, the next day. Can we continue playing with God? Can we continue not sharing what we know? People are being baptized. You know how many people got baptized? 1,300 on that Sabbath. About 1,400 people got baptized during a whole series just with 52 people from Japan. But it did not happen because of them. Because the members worked. The pastors there worked. And people gave their lives over to Jesus. This is happening in the Philippines. Why can't it happen here in Japan? Because we do not believe that God has the power to do things. We think it's only by our own means, our own knowledge that people are going to give their lives over to Jesus. We know this. And I was part of that. Dale Jean was part of that. Dale Jean was not a pastor, but she preached. People listened to the message and came up and gave their lives to Jesus. You might be here, and maybe you're still struggling to make a decision for Christ. Some of us need to be Rebaptize. Some of that of us need to recommit their life, our lives to Jesus, because we don't, we're not living the way we're supposed to live our lives. So Jesus is calling you today to make a decision for Him. He's coming. Overcoming the unexpected is simply you don't know what's gonna come. Satan has planned things for your life, and he wants you to follow through. He's not expecting you to give your life over to Jesus. He's not expecting you to to surrender fully to God. But God is hoping that you will hear his voice and give up all those things and follow him. As I close... I started coming to church as a baby boy. I was in church for almost my whole life. At first, I came to church not because I wanted to, because I had to, because my mom and my dad chose for me to be at church every single Sabbath. After a while, I laid my eyes on a girl. Young I was. But because of that girl, I was so excited to go to church every Sabbath because we exchanged letters. And so that was my motive. I don't know if my mom knew, but my motive, going to church every Sabbath. But pretty soon, that relationship also didn't work out. I was disappointed. And so I changed my motive going to church. It was to bring on the table something that I could do, my talent, music, sing, then I started playing the piano. And so that was my thing that would bring me to church every Sabbath. Not so much about Jesus, yeah, but there was something I was getting. It was something selfish. Every Sabbath I would go, I would would play, I would sing in the choir, and that fulfilled me. Maybe some of you are coming to church for something like that friendship, um, something you do at church. And every single Sabbath, you look forward to that. 
not really of the life that we need to live. But pretty soon, what happened? Those things, my talent, did not satisfy me either. And I understood that I needed to have a personal relationship with my God. Being the pastor taught me a lot because it's no longer what I really like to do that I do. But I see you every Sabbath. Only time I could actually speak to you and share with you important eternal life messages and decisions. It's on Sabbath. I might have started with the wrong motives, with the wrong ambitions, wrong opinions about what Sabbath or even worshiping God is all about. But today I see clearly, and I don't want to continue coming to church just for the sake of coming to church, but I'm coming to church because I know there's one person in there that needs to make a decision for Christ. There's one person here that needs Jesus because he needs to be saved. And that's why every single Sabbath, I'm going to come, I'm going to make myself available, I'm going to make an appeal at every single Sabbath message that I get to preach because you need to make a decision for Christ. Today I want to ask, would you like to also say, Jesus... I've lived my life just to please myself. I don't really care about how other people live their lives. If they even need you, I just care about my own self. But today, I want to change. I want to have a relationship with you. I want to feel your presence filled my life every single day so that I can be a witness, a blessing to somebody else. But you see, you cannot reach out to somebody else when you yourself are lost. You cannot bring somebody else to church or to the truth when you yourself are not in the truth. So it starts with you. And so today, I just want you to make that decision for yourself. Lord, I want to have a saving relationship with you. I want to feel that I am saved and I can now contribute to bring others to you. This afternoon, we'll talk about prayer walking and I want you to join. And later on, we'll go and distribute tracts. But today, is there anyone who feel that I need to make a decision for Christ? I've been an Adventist almost my whole life, but something is lacking. I'm not satisfied. Something in my life is not right. But it's so difficult for me to just give myself to Jesus. But it's about time. Because God is calling you. Who will say, yes, here I am. Use me. If that's you, you can stand where you are. Some of you may even think, I've been coming to church. I've been listening to the messages every Sabbath. People have reached out to me, but I'm not ready for baptism. But I want to study more. Is there anyone who like to say, Pastor, I want to study more and give my life to Jesus. Any hands? Amen, sister. Could you come closer? I want to pray for you. I want to study more and I want to eradicate, just give myself to Jesus and be a blessing. Come forward, come. Those who raise your hands, come forward. I want to pray for you. Is there anyone who would like to say, Lord, I've been studying and I know the truth and I want to be baptized. Um, yes, I'm ready for baptism. Is there anyone? It's not me calling, it's Jesus calling you. Oh, I want to be rebaptized because I know the truth, but I've left the truth and I've done the things I like. 
I've broken my vows with God, but today I want to be rebaptized. Is there anyone? Amen. Amen. You see, it's not, <laughs> it's not me. It's a decision you're making with your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And He knows your heart and He knows all of us. We can pretend to be in the truth. We can pretend to know it all. We can pretend to come to church every Sabbath, but God knows our hearts. And so as I close, and I, I'm going to pray for these people, and all of you standing, let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Father, I thank you for the things you've done in Mindoro. I've seen members who have gone there. They just got to the place and we totally changed. The messages they preach every night changed them. And they led so many souls to you. And Father, here we stand. Your people have been coming to church every single Sabbath. But you know the lives they live every single day. Lord, we are weak. Yes, we are not perfect. But we know that we can be better if we fully commit and surrender to you. And so, Father, at this moment, I would like you in a special way to bless each and every one of us standing right now. That you may take away whatever is holding us back. Satan wants us to keep and stay in that misery and enjoy sin. Why you want to save us from that? Help us, dear Father, to be open and confess those sins and allow you to change us. Father, help us not to be the same. Help us to be a blessing to someone because we were not called into this church or even this movement to just be useless, Father. Everyone here could bring one soul, two souls, three, a whole family at your feet. If only we live the truth the way we know it. And I pray for my brothers and sisters that came forward, want Bible study, want to recommit their lives through rebaptism or baptism. I pray that you bless them in a special way. That Father, the decision to come forward means that they are not ashamed to tell you, Lord, I want to walk with you. I want to choose you over sin, over Satan. You have said in the Bible, I've set before you life and death, blessing and curses. But you want us to choose life because you have made us to live eternally. So I pray that this be their portion today and every single day of their life. That as we study that every single day they will commit their lives until baptism. And even after that, that they will be kept in the faith until you come back. Thank you for blessing us. And thank you for listening to our prayers. For we ask you all these things in the powerful, powerful and wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.